Hey guys, Sean Hammond with Premier Guitar. We are at Winter Nam 2018 in Anaheim, California, doing the third of our daily Gear Guru live streams. We've got Mike Matthews from Electro Harmonics. Mike, thanks for joining us. And we got Jamie Stillman from Earthquaker Devices, two heavyweights in the pedal business. You guys are, uh, I mean, you guys, everybody knows you guys. We make so, Mike, you want to talk about, I guess, the biggest surprises for you when you got into the business besides, you know, getting to hang with Hendrix? Well, uh, well, yeah, d d Hendrix, he was just a, a regular guy, another musician, and we just used to talk band talk. You know, I, I used to go up to his hotel room. He had his hair set in pink hair curlers. He had no toilet, no, no sink in his room. And we would just talk, band talk for a couple of hours. Uh, this this guy here, that. But anyway, um, actually, there were two businesses. I founded Electromonics in '68, and at that time, my attitude was grow, 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 be out at the edge. Every good idea, jump on it, expand, and 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 build a a, a financial empire, so that I could whip death. In my own li in my own lifetime, because uh, you know, a thousand years from now, if we don't destroy ourselves, then maybe we'll be getting you know we'll be living longer and longer, and who knows? How was but, that ladder battle going? Well, with you know, whenever we, whenever we had problems, well, I got into a lot of research with ESP and all sorts of stuff, and also I was I smoked too much pot, and we had a lot of firsts with electromonics. The first um, uh, 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 low-cost flanger, the electric missus. The first uh, analog delay, the memory man. The first um, um, uh, inexpensive um, sampler, the instant replay and super replay. The first looper. In 1982, we brought out the 16-second digital delay, which evolved from when we brought out the first cheap digital delay, a two second delay, and I said, saw how long it was. I said, geez, I wonder what will happen if the, you can expand this. But, although whenever I had a problem, I was able to solve it until I had too many problems at once, fighting labor racketeers, uh, Panasonic didn't deliver to me the Bucket Brigade chips, they gave them to all the Japanese companies, anyway, and I had a host of other problems, and I just collapsed. And I went bankrupt. Then, then um, uh, our best engineer, uh, David Cockerell, who designed all the synthy, uh, 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 synthesizers in England, the number two synth company behind Moog, he worked for us. And I got him a deal with Akai Japan, and then J Akai dominated samplers for many years. But they refused to get into... Uh, multi-track digital recording when I told them to uh, many times and, th and th then they eventually went bankrupt anyway I, I started first getting back into business uh, selling vacuum tubes made in Russia and now we no yeah well no sense and now we have many brands we own the the General X Gold Lion brand Tongue Soul we have Mullet uh, exclusive in many parts of the world also EH and um, uh, Svetlana and um, Softex still, which was our first brand. So you do, you kind of do have that empire. Well, I don't know, <laughs> but the, but then in the early '90s, um, I I saw that all the stuff, and I made, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of pedals throughout the '70s, and I saw saw that all that stuff that I made in the '70s was selling for much more than, than in the 70s and the 90s because this new vintage market developed. Uh, and, and so, and meanwhile, the Soviet Union fell apart and my, uh, my, my partner, Arusha Bidikova, whose father co-invented the hydrogen bomb in Russia, she um, hooked me up with a, a local f factory you know, every everything in, in Russia went bankrupt, and in Soviet Union, they went bankrupt. The whole military and everything in Russia was military. So she hooked me with a small military factory in Saint Petersburg that made test equipment, uh, and and I just gave them the circuit diagram of the Big Muff, 
and they just rebuilt it you know with a new chassis redesigned a foot switch and that became first the soft tech uh, uh over the red army overdrive and then when i got my trademark back eventually uh, uh electromonics and then later on we started making the stuff back in the U usa but uh but meanwhile going on a long time with the second company my attitude totally changed instead of going on every single new idea I wait patiently. I'm most interested in, in being strong financially, having cash, having no bank debt. We canceled all our bank lines of credit. We pay all our bills. We wait, and we have balance on what we uh, what we work on. And I'm not going to whip death, but uh, we'll we'll be successful with business. Well, obviously, you're running it very smartly. Um, you. Uh, multiple things you said brought up new questions but um, I guess the last point kind of made me think well and when you mentioned David Cockerell is that is how uh, like the people know a lot of the history of the company because you're so you know well known and and you've been behind so many well your company has been behind so many huge products how involved right now and in the past have you been with the actual design process well it, it in business, I've always been into business since I was five years old, fishing balls out of the sewers. And then my mom gave me piano lessons when I was uh, six years old and then a professional teacher. But then I quit in the fourth grade because I used to give concerts. But when I was climbing up the rafters in my class, the teacher canceled my concert at elementary school. So I said, hell with it. I quit. But then when rock and roll was becoming big uh, uh, in the mid mid to later 50s I started playing boogie woogie and got into playing in a rock and roll band at college and I loved that I loved playing at the fraternity houses and in and and the fraternity parties those were the best better than clubs better than concerts they were more fun and um, Let's see, I forgot what, what I was talking well, so, about. So how, like right now, how many designers do you have working we have a, with you? Uh, ten. Ten? Ten, and yeah. Do you have much hands-on oh, circuit oh, design what experience, I do? or do you mainly say, let's go for well, this sound? Okay. And the, the third thing I got into, my father, when I graduated high school and was going to college, said, you got to have a profession. So I picked electrical engineering, but I never had dreams of being an electrical engineer. But I learned a lot. So with between those, you know, the business, music, although I'm not a guitar player, and the uh, engineering, yeah, I had an overall thing. I did play a big design role on the Big Muff. Uh, uh, Bob Meyer designed that, but then I fine-tuned that to make it a very sweet-sounding system by playing around and discovered three important po uh, points to roll off the high frequency so it had a sweet violin like sound but in general uh, I have other, other designers great designers and and they design the product now in the 70s I would decide every feature that would be in it but now I just decide what product we're gonna go after and 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 they come up with the features and and that's it I do have certain basic rules well, that, what are those basic rules? Well, I don't know. Don't you want to give it? Trade, give trade it, secrets? Give a chance. No, I'll tell oh, you. Yeah. What, what are, are the basic rules, Mike? <laughs> tell me the basic rules. Okay. okay, I'll tell you the basic rules. First of all, uh, once we set a design structure, you know, a lot of times the engineers, you, you know, they, 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 they spent weeks or months, a couple of months going through a design, and then all of a sudden they want to add stuff. And but by this time we've designed the chassis and the, the, one of the rules is once we decide on the basic st structure that's it you got new ideas that'll be for a new product yes. because it, it, basically fundamentally you've got to have great designers but you can't have great designers unless you pay them and you can't pay them unless you make money <laughs> so basically we're a business we got to be a business we got to make money to make designers and you can't just go on and on and on designing a product that's one of the rules another rule i have is balance we work on simple analog products some complex analog products some simple 
uh, digital ones and some complex digital ones and some always trying to come out with something unique that nobody has ever done as opposed to an improved uh, echo or reverb. Like our nine series, uh, uh, you know, the Mel 9, the Synth 9, the B9 organ machines, like our POG series, and, uh, and our, now our current um, uh, Super Eagle Plus is very unique. And, uh, and also we want to get back and play a dominant role in loopers since we were the first ones to bring out loopers and we're very happy on the success we're having now with so our just, just made a big announcement on, on, on this show on, 90, on, on 95,000 six track looper with a seventh mix down track but uh, so those so basically we're a business we got to not uh, get also any design that's going to take more than a year i don't want to do that too many companies gone out of business because they've been designing and designing and designing and never come out or even by the time they come out their idea is obsolete so, so we that's those are some of the those rules. are the basics jamie i, I heard you give are. an enthusiastic <laughs> yes when on that first basic rule of setting a limit on when there's got there has to be an end when we give sometimes when we give things to people to test out it's like they give feedback like you should do this you should do this and it's like no you're looking for bugs. <laughs> I'm done. You got to be done with this at some point. But those are essentially the same rules that I would apply. There's, there's, there's got to be an end to something. You can work things to death, and you can spend a ton of money on it. In my situation, you know, it's me, <laughs> so I can pull the plug, and it's, and I keep things super simple. Um, aside from looking for firsts, I try to have unique features, but it's hard to keep up with electro harmonics. <laughs> What is uh, what do you find like the crushing most crushing it in firsts all the time really what is it you find is most effective when you're looking for those first is it trying to it's be more aware of the market or try to get your head out of the market and just be like a, a guitar player getting out of the market i i am mostly looking for i have an idea or like a concept and i'll start working on it and i just play through it and i keep playing and playing and hearing like these are the things that i need to change finding where i need to change them and I know that I'm happy with a product and I find it to be interesting when I can just play through it and I'm not thinking, mm, it's got too much of this or that or I need to adjust these things. I get to a point eventually where I'm like, I'm really happy with this thing. Let's see what our most critical thinkers, you know, what their opinion is yeah. on this. And, you know, I'll take some advice here and there. But, you know, ultimately when I'm happy with it, it's like, okay, now it's ready. And I, and I think another rule for me is like, don't show it to anyone in the outside world until you're ready to sell it because it, it, things get weird it is as the guy who is in charge of the business and the design and and well i'm thinking i guess backing up as a guitar player is it kind of like when like i mean everyone's different but when i write a song or whatever like you kind of know it's you got the right riff and maybe the right parts you want to put together you're yeah. not so sure on the arrangement and you're not sure on a bunch of other factors and it sort of evolves over time it, is it similar with designing pedals and if I, so at what point do you know okay just this has to be the song or this yeah. has to be the pedal vibe, i have to vibe, stop vibe oriented uh i just know like I just, when i can go sit and play with it and it's like four or five hours go by and i'm like cool. and, and you're cool. just totally happy I'm that happy, whole time i'm huh? happy with that but i you know you also if I find like one little thing wrong, like it stresses me out. <laughs> Do you guys ever change anything after a product has been de uh, debuted and you're like, oh, I should have made the, this resistor a slightly different value? <laughs> like, why did you ask me that? Uh, <laughs> you can, you can uh, decline to uh, answer of that. Course. I, I'm guessing most of companies course. do. Uh, but if we do, it's advertise you know it's yeah. like a v2 or something like that by the time something comes out it's 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 usually been yeah. fairly well tested one thing that also came to mind when mike was talking about the business aspect is for you you have to balance both duties which are very you know left and right brained how hard uh, is that especially as if you've gotten more successful I'm very punk rock about business i could handle things up to a point and once earthquaker got too big my wife julie stepped in and kind of took it over she's much more business oriented I'm involved on a daily basis, but like more in like, here's my opinion on this. But we have so many people who are experts in like a specific thing they do. It's better to leave it up to them. Like I can't, 
everybody can't be everything. Right, right. Like, you know, My, I fully well, trust them. Yeah. Got to have people to help save your sanity. Yeah. Um, Mike, I had something that came up back when you were talking about the Big Muff. Arguably, that's your most famous product. And when you were talking about, you know, the Sobtech version, at what point did you realize become aware of how just fanatical people are about the different versions of the Big Muff. Like, I assume that when you built the Softec one, you weren't like, didn't realize that, you know, 30 years, 40 years later, there were going to be so many companies building re, you know, clones of it, basically, or stuff inspired by it. Well, well my personal favorite was the very first one, which a lot of people call the triangular Big Muff, but not all of them. Uh, some of them... What, what I liked was not that, that great, really long, sweet sustain, but also when you pick pluck the string for a fraction of a second, a transient leaked through that gave it a little click. Very, uh, that was my favorite. But I have not been able to recapture exactly what that is. And then when with Russia, the basic design the, the, the circuit design was the same, but they built those with Russian parts, with different tolerances, different transistors, and so some people uh, excuse me, prefer the sound of the Russian Big Muff, and we're doing great with our issue now of the green Russian Big Muff. Yeah. Some people like the original Big Muff, and then more recently we've come out with a Billy what Billy Corgan's favorite was that used an, an op amp where our, where our basic Big Muffs always had four transistors. This one had a op amp and uh, I think two transistors. And, and it, it, it's not as smooth, but it's more edgy. And, and, and so we're selling tons of that. I, it just been uh, recent. I, I mean, uh, the last two, three years, uh, yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, and when I mentioned the Softec, that's just an example. Like every iteration of the Big Muff, there are adherents who like swear by it or collect all of them, and then they can get on forums and talk about ad nauseum about the, why they're better or what differentiates them. And that's got to be both flattering and frustrating, kind of. Uh, no, it's flattering. I mean, I'm I'm mainly interested in total combined sales because the more you sell, the more you have a, a, you know satisfied people out there that are. The, the dealers buying them and consumers you know, buying them and dealers reordering. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy about the Big Muff, but I'm, I'm happy about all, all sorts of our products, both uh, uh, our resurgence on loopers, our full range of loopers at great prices, our POG series, which nobody has been able to replicate at all, and, and, and its offshoots like the Pitchfork. And I am particularly excited about our Cockfight Plus, which I think is the best Wawa pedal in the world, and the price is rock bottom. That and the Whaler Wa, I'm really happy about those. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm happy. Last question, unless you guys had any questions that came up and you are responsible. I got a question. Who names your pedals? Pardon me? Who names your pedals? I, I pretty much name really? almost all of them, although if somebody comes up with a good name and I like it, but I, that's my final decision. And also on the Big Muff, so you understand the history of that name, when I came out with the LPB1, we have that, this, this little box for it. So I wanted to make use of that box, so it came out with four other little pedals that went into that box. One was the Screaming Bird Treble Booster. And we were the first company to come out with crazy names, the yeah. Mole Bass Booster the Ego microphone booster, and the Muff overdrive, the Muff fuzz, because it had a muffled sound. I liked that slight overdrive. Later on, when we came, we were working on the Big Muff, I came up with the name Big Muff, partly to play on the, the, the reputation at that time of the Muff. And also, it was this was the this was 1969. It was the 60s, the <laughs> sexual revolution, the anti-war revolution, the freedom to do anything radical, anti -establishment. So uh, I said, the hell with it. I'm giving it this radical name, <laughs> Big Muff. So it's a double meaning and just just having fun. Yeah. They're great names. 
Any other questions for each other before I ask the last one? Uh, no, but you better not cheat on your wife because Earthquaker's future depends on your joint collaboration. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> the, the voice of experience? No. <laughs> uh, well, I have, I have four great kids, two from two different wives. All Rock right. and roll! What, what are you guys most excited about when you look ahead to next year or just getting back to the shop and what you're working on right now without sp spilling secrets or anything? Like, what's, what's getting you to work each day besides the bills and expanding the empire? And uh, In Ohio, it's freezing right now. This is usually the time of year that I get to design things. I spend a lot of time indoors making things. The rest of the year is usually travel and business related things are getting ready for new releases. So it's just, this is my favorite time. I like working on stuff the most, and this is when I usually do it. I've just accidentally fallen into the cycle. So that's what, that's what I'm looking forward to. And also getting away from noise. <laughs> Agreed. How about you, Mike? Well, uh, uh, like Jamie said, he, he doesn't uh, pre-announce new products, and I don't discuss anything we're working on. You know, why, why tell Jamie what I'm working on or Boss or any of our competitors? Uh, but I'm really looking forward to our bringing out two uh, guitar amps. Uh, uh, Different from the soft techs that you're well, coming with? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, re I'm reissuing the MiG-50 head, which, which was the soft tech MiG-50, which sounded great. But the ones we built in the early 90s in Russia they mechanically fell apart but these are rock out of build but and 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 we're selling them you know pilot quantities in the USA but to sell them worldwide there's regulations up the kazoo safety regulations so we're waiting to get the international safety regulations uh, so that we can market those worldwide and then the other thing is we have a combo that's just a head the MiG-50 although we do supply a cabinet the other thing is um, uh, a, a reissue of our Dirt Road Special, which has a built-in Holy Grail Max in it. And it sounds great. The price is great. In fact, it's a long story. I think it's too long to tell you about how the uh, Ramones used the Dirt Road Special. It's a long story on that. I'll wait for the next uh, interview. All right, well, speaking of that, we are doing these Gear Guru live streams every day of NAM. We've done two other ones. We have another one tomorrow. I want to thank Jamie and Mike for coming and uh, encourage you guys to come back tomorrow morning at 11, where we'll be talking to Paul Reed Smith and Nick Hooper, both great luthiers. And today at 5, we will have a live stream where the PG editors will tell the, their favorite pics of stuff we saw today. We'll do the same thing tomorrow at about 5, 5.30 Pacific. So 11 Pacific, 11 a.m. Pacific tomorrow morning, 5, 5.30 p.m. Pacific today and tomorrow. Come back. And thanks again, Mike. Thanks, Jamie. See you guys.